welcome to St. Thomas Methodist Church in Clettenburg Bay. The message is brought to you by Reverend Timothy Rist. So Father, we stand before you now bringing our praise, our worship, our tithes, our offerings, bringing you our prayers, bringing you our lives, bringing you who we are. And so Father, in this time too though, we understand that there are those that need you more perhaps than we do. And so, Father, in faith, we bring to you now those in crisis, those in grief, those who are in doubt, those who are in pain, those who need a word from you. We bring them to you and we offer them in prayer. And Father, we bring especially those places in our world where there is war and violence and death. And Holy Spirit, we cry out for peace. And so we send you, God of peace, with our prayers to unite with those praying for peace in those places. Prince of Peace, may you reign. Receive too, Father, the families for prayer. And so we bring you all this this morning and ask you to receive us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, I just wondered too, are there many of you here like me who feel that your washing machine has gone on the blink over December? It's shrinking all your clothes. Have you noticed that? Are there others, are there some of you whose clothes have got smaller? Huh? You see? Yes. And so while I was commented on this shirt in the first service, I've got to be honest and tell you it's the only shirt that does really do its thing without the buttons parting in the front. No. <laughs> so if your clothes have shrunk, that's okay. All right. But I hope it means you've had a good time of, of being with friends and family and you've you feasted well over Christmas time. But we're going to prepare for the year ahead. And that's what our reading is about. That's what the service is going to lead us for. Uh, and you might, have, if you were here with me last week, remember I said begin this year with the end of the year in mind. So where do you want to end the year? Pray through that before you start the year. Well, today we're going to turn it around and say we are beginning at the beginning. Mark chapter 1 from verse 1. And uh, I always, friends, I might step out of our planned readings for the year to follow themes at other times. We will be doing that shortly. Uh, we'll be looking, for example, at wisdom. Now, before we do that, there are some readings that we really do need to follow each year. They set, put us in place again. And this is one of those readings. I will always use this at the beginning of every, every year. Mark chapter 1, about Jesus and his baptism. John the Baptist prepares the way. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. Here's a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then that next heading, the baptism and temptation of Jesus. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, 
and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Amen. So today we said, begin at the beginning. And really that's what this passage is about. It's at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And so I thought we need to make sure at the beginning of each year, we begin with where Jesus began. Right? Connecting himself, and you'll get there, connecting himself with God. But you might have picked up, as I read for you this morning, that the context of Mark itself is actually based in the Old Testament. It's in the voice of Isaiah the prophet. Prepare the way. I am sending someone. I am calling someone. That's Isaiah. Now, why do I say I'll begin each year with this reading, with a story? I enjoy watching the Premier League football. Anyone else here do that? Eh? Sort of Sunday afternoons are reserved for me and the TV and watching football. Obviously, I enjoy other sports too, and other sports will do a similar exercise to what I'm going to share with you now. But often when they cross for the Premier League matches, before that time, you'll notice the players on the field doing various drills. They've got cones out on the field. I know hockey does this as well. They have cones out with drills on the Astro. Rugby players are doing their drills. And sometimes when I watch these professionals doing all of these drills, I do wonder if they don't get bored with doing the same thing over and over again. And you want to think something like, well, you guys are professionals. You paid huge sums of, sums of money. You should know what you're doing. Just get on with it and do it. Now arrive at the stadium and get on with the job. Why do you need all these drills? And that sort of approach is wrong. Obviously, my approach. Because the drills are there to change the mindset of the player. It's to say, whatever you were doing in the bus or doing with your family beforehand, this drill is now to get you focused on your skills, on your abilities, on what it is that you, you and I have planned together, coach and team, what it is that you are going to do when, the, when that whistle blows and the match starts. The drills are there to get you focused, to get you in the right zone, get your feet moving as the football, footballers. And so this reading... Uh, this way of sharing with, with you this morning is about you and I doing one of the drills that we need in our faith to get our faith on track and ready for the challenges that are coming up this year. As we've already liked last week, begin with the end in mind. Where do we want to be by the end of the year? Well, here's a drill, a spiritual drill for you this morning. And I know, you know I'm sorry, I, in advance, I think I did two sermons in one week. And so I'm going to go quickly. Can you take a breath? Are you ready? Right. I'll put my notes up on, on our website and, uh, and so on too. I'll send them out by telegram. Because I really need you to journey quickly with me this morning in these drills as we say it together. First part of this drill, and I'm going to say it over and over and over again this year. Keep Jesus at the center of everything. Center of your life, center of your conversations, center of your attitude, center of judgment that you want to, to make at whatever time it is. Whatever it is that you're reading, can I put Jesus in that story? Whatever it is that you're seeing, what would Jesus be seeing if he was with me? Jesus as the focal point for everything this year. And we said last year that's quite tough. But we need to own that, right? Wisdom, what we'll do a little bit later on, will give you some tools for this, ex for this very uh, important exercise. So when we read from the Bible, and at, there are times in fellowship groups, small groups, Bible study groups, I will have people throwing verses at me out of context and out of character with who God is and who Jesus is. And I'm warning you now, if you do that, I'm going to pull you back to Jesus every time. Right? Because Jesus said, I am not opposed to the law. I am the fulfillment 
of everything that is there. So whatever is there must be balanced by who Jesus is. It's quite a thought that. And so when we go through this year, we, we need to then understand a broad picture of who Jesus is. So keep the whole picture, birth of Jesus. We've just done that. Jesus at the manger. End of March, we're at the cross. Can you believe it? That's Easter. So we go manger, cross, Holy Spirit, ministry of Jesus. Try and keep the broad picture of Jesus in mind as we visit individual stories about him. And an individual story about Jesus is not the whole story. It's one moment, but always part of the bigger picture, okay? Keep it all in place. We can't read the Old Testament without keeping Jesus in focus. And we can't read letters in the Gospels without keeping Jesus in focus. Yeah, Jesus, and I, let me say it again now. If we keep Jesus in the center of everything, then as I said to you in December, right now in the conflict in the Middle East, Jesus is walking the streets of Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all the Jewish towns. And Jesus is walking the streets of Gaza. Do you get that? You cannot remove him from any part of that picture as much as we might be tempted to want to. Jesus is in everything and everything is around him. Right? We did that reading. Held together by him. So at his baptism, very quickly, Jesus identified with his call and you, this might be strange for you to follow these thoughts with me now because you might think Jesus understood always from when he was a little child that his role was to be Messiah. I suggest otherwise this morning. Verse 10. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Powerful moment. Do you understand? There's quotes of the Old Testament there. You are my dearly loved son. That's Psalm 2, verse 7. My dearly loved one. Mark's quoting there. You bring me great joy. That comes from Isaiah 42 chapter 1, and if you follow the chapters after that of Isaiah, you see Isaiah is talking about the suffering servant, the one who will come and who will die on behalf of the others. And so right at his baptism, and I'm quoting now from my first source, William Barclay. You might not have used him before. Friends, I just need, I do this because I want you to understand it's not my thinking that drives a lot of my messages. It's the thinking of other scholars, other people. They teach me, I share it with you, right? I'm not the fount of all wisdom and knowledge. So Barclay says this, Therefore, in his baptism, Jesus realized first that he was the Messiah. How's that for a moment? God's anointed king. And second, he realized that this involved not power and glory, but suffering and a cross. The cross did not come as a surprise, on Jesus as a surprise. From the first moment of answering his call, he saw it ahead. The baptism shows us Jesus asking for God's heavenly mark of approval and receiving the destiny of the cross. Begin with the end in mind. Quite a thought that, that Jesus, as he is baptized and he comes out of the water, has this moment of divine revelation on him. This is what is happening now. How do we know that? Well, at his baptism, heaven torn open. Can you think of another story that tells us when something is torn to reveal God at work? Can you think of another story later on? Anyone? Do you want to shout it out? 
the curtain in the temple at the crucifixion. At the beginning of his ministry, heaven tears open, in the powerful imagery, heaven tears open, that which separates God from people is torn open and poured out over Jesus. At the end, at the crucifixion, right, the temple curtain that separates God from people is torn open. The cross opens up everything again, access to God through Jesus. Begin with the end in mind. And Jesus began, in this baptism moment, understanding suffering would come and cross probably would come. Quite a thought. And then at his baptism, Jesus identifies with humanity, all of humanity. That's why I keep stressing where Jesus is walking at the moment in all the conflict zones. Jesus identifies with everyone, not just with me, not maybe with just some of you. He identifies with everyone. John the Baptist coming out of the desert with this radical ministry, and the people are flocking to him in droves. They want to hear what he says. They want to see what he's doing. And there's this unprecedented revival taking place. And I do believe it's at that moment of revival and release of Holy Spirit power among the people that God says to Jesus, 30-year-old man, now is your time. Wasn't ready, wasn't that moment before, but now is your time. The prophecy is in motion. Prepare the way. I'm sending one who will come. Right? And so Jesus, by going to John for baptism, identifies himself with that movement of the Spirit among the people. John the Baptist is right. Jesus is not there for the baptism of repentance. Why are you here? Can I paraphrase that? Hey? Why are you here? What are you doing here? I shouldn't even be untying your shoes. Like the slaves do in our homes and they untie shoes. I should, I'm not even worthy of doing that. Why are you here at the baptism? And Jesus is not there for the moment of repentance. Jesus is there for the moment of beginning and standing in solidarity with the work of the Holy Spirit among the people. And Jesus is saying, I'm part of this move of the Spirit amongst all the people. I'm part of this with you. I am here. I go in the water and I come out of the water. And I'm quoting an idea there from Professor Powery. He says this. He says, Jesus' baptism was an act of solidarity with the rest of the community in the spirit of John's transforming mission. Powerful moment. And so then, as one of the drills that we're doing, okay, you with me so far? How are we going to prepare our spiritual selves for standing in solidarity with others? What are we going to do this year? And we will obviously journey towards those points together. But this story of the baptism is something we must soak ourselves in time and time and time again. Because it's Jesus' commitment and his courage, his obedience to answer the call in his life and to stand up at the right time and get going that revolutionizes everything. And so you and I, if we're going to have Jesus as the focus, as we said, Jesus in our lives, Jesus in our words and our thoughts, Jesus in our prayers and our songs, Jesus in all that we do, understand, we must understand, that if Jesus is in solidarity with everyone, I need to be in solidarity with everyone. How goes it with you? Now, being baptized, friends, doesn't make us perfect. And if you have not been baptized, and you're on a journey with the Lord, and you'd love to be baptized, won't you come and see me? Let's have a conversation. It would be wonderful one day to have a number of you that are not baptized down at the river with me, and with all of us, eh? And we celebrate the baptism together. If you've never been baptized, let's talk about it. Let's do, do, let's do that. But understand, when, 
for those of us who have been baptized, and if you are going to be baptized this year, baptism doesn't mean everything is all solved. We know all the answers. It doesn't mean that I have all the theology I need. That's why I quote from other scholars. Being baptized is really a very public statement about something that God is doing within us, right? Connecting with God, connecting with everyone else through Holy Spirit. So again, remind you, through our baptism, if you've been baptized or you will be baptized, baptism then means this. That through our baptism, we stand, we must identify with Jesus and his call to people. God created you and me to do amazing things. Will you own that this year? I've said it to you before, God doesn't create you and, you and me to just be mundane. All right? And to be, I'm saying the word boring carefully. All right? Bored by life and bored by, no. God says, I give you life and life. I've come to be with you. So you can have abundant life and do amazing things with the life that you have. And I wonder what that word amazing will mean for you this year. What way will you allow yourself to be connected to God and to others in new ways that allows God to do amazing and wonderful things through you, through our church? And then remember very quickly to baptism with Jesus is not just about baptism of the water. It's also water and the Spirit. As John said, someone's coming soon who's greater than I am. Verse 8, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Little fun fact for your personal Bible study. Jesus never baptized anyone with water. Don't know if you know that. It wasn't his job to do that. He baptized people with the Holy Spirit. Long before Acts 2 actually happened. Long before Pentecost, by the way. Right? Proof for that, John chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus is sending out disciples and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he sent them. Baptized into the family of God. I want to ask us to think about what that means this year. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yes, with us. We are baptized into the community, into the family of who God is. But if that's true, friends, when someone asks you this year, and it is true, when someone asks you this year, what is God like? Debate and discussion, trying to take you on about something. How do you even know what God is like? I want you to point them straight to Jesus. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Therefore, if anyone is trying to show you a picture of God that doesn't fit the picture of Jesus, you can tell them to shh. Because that's not who God is. God is who Jesus is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three but one. If you want to know how the Holy Spirit works, what do you do? You look to Jesus. If you wonder how the Father operates, right? You look to Jesus. And Jesus makes it clear. We sing one of those songs that says there are no orphans in God's family. He takes the orphan and makes them a son and daughter, we sing. So I want to affirm you, you're, you're not alone, you're never going to be alone. God is with you and the family of God is with you. We need to learn to be better at God's family stuff together. All right? We are in this together with Jesus. Very quickly, in our baptism and in Jesus' baptism, he understood his real identity. We don't know, friends, we don't know what happened in the 30 years before Jesus began his ministry. We have an idea, child, he was a presenter to the temple. He showed all wonderful examples of, of skill, interpretation of scripture, teaching as a young child. We know those moments. And then there's a gap. 
And you might read things and see things and all of that about what happened in that gap. But that is a lot of that is, uh, is conjecture. What we do know is from the moment of baptism, when he makes his ministry public. Here I am. And that's what we focus on, his baptism. Heaven opens as we, there's this powerful image of a man coming out of the water, the dove descending down. You are my son whom I love. I'm well pleased with you. At this moment, the beginning of the beginning is when it happens for Jesus. That's why we base our ministry on that moment with him. Very quickly, last quote. From Reverend Dr. Stephen Haltgren. He's a New Testament scholar. He lectures New Testament, obviously. A marvelous aspect of Jesus' baptism is its reminder that he's not only our Lord, but also our brother. He was baptized just as we are. He shares in our humanity. Although Jesus is Son of God par excellence and our Lord, he is not these in a selfish way that hoards the Father's inheritance for himself. God's making Jesus Lord through his death and resurrection and his giving of the Holy Spirit makes us co-inheritors with him of everything that the Father has to give to his children, above all, eternal life. It's an amazing thought that. Everything that was given to Jesus is given through baptism, our baptism, to us. Baptism of water, baptism of the Spirit. So in conclusion, friends, begin with the beginning. What does that mean for you? Begin with the beginning. Keep Jesus as the focus, the center of everything this year. Love him and have him as Lord and Savior in your life. Be a child of God. Live as a child of God. Understand that requires you change perspective, you change attitude, you change words, all those things. Understand you're not alone, you're part of the body of Christ. Understand you're called by God to love and to serve. And not just love and serve those you like or I like, but to stand in solidarity with everyone. Humility, obedience, courage, commitment, all of that at Jesus' baptism is what we are called to be. Can we do that together this year? Let's pray that we will, eh? Right in this moment, begin in the right way as God's family together in this place, in whichever place you're going to go back to, take the challenge with you there, into that place. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us in listening to this message. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. In this way, you will be notified when the next message is available. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.